Hey guys, real quick, Dr. Dale here. All right, so I want you guys to do me a favor. Before you start this episode, please hit that pause button and click subscribe or click follow or click like, whatever it is. We work really hard to bring you guys this good information to uplift the entire community, and we really appreciate you guys supporting our efforts and our work. Love you guys. Enjoy the episode. What is up, family? It's Dr. Dale, the author of How to Raise a Doctor Wisdom from Parents Who Did It, Pre-Med Mondays. Black Men and White Coats, and the Dr. Doc Children series. Grab your copies on Amazon.com or click the links below, and I will mail you a copy for free. You got to cover your own shipping and handling, however. And you're listening to Black Men and White Coats podcast, a place where black male clinicians have the platform to share their stories with listeners like you. Man, super excited to tell you about today's guest, man. I'll tell you why here in a second. But again, hope you guys are staying safe. Right now, I'm recording this. It's late at night. I need to be in bed, actually. I'm covering the COVID ICU right now. I'm tired, and I'm up too late doing this, but I love you guys so much that I want to get this podcast out so you guys can hear this, right? And I'm so excited. I just got I just got this podcast in and and I love it so much and I couldn't go to sleep. I said, let me get up, let me record this, let me get this prepared so we can get this one out to you guys as soon as possible. So man, today, man, what an awesome story this is gonna be, man. All right, okay, real fast again. Before I get into that, let me just remind you guys of a few other things here. Um the main one I want to tell you about is the is the documentary. You guys know we're working on the Black Men and White Coast documentary, and we are just about done with this thing. We're just about done with this thing, and I'm, I'm about to start sending out updates to everybody who supported. So, you know, a little bit over a year ago, we, we launched this Kickstarter, and we raised a, a decent chunk of change from this Kickstarter, which was, man, one of the hardest things I've done. It was a lot of hard work, but we did it. And we set out to make this film, and we are just about done with the film. It's crazy, man. A year later, and it's amazing. Can't wait till you guys see it. It's so amazing, right? So, um, you know, that's kind of what's had me super excited here over the past year, really, but more so over the past month as I'm actually getting to see it and see it come together and just thinking about all the lives that it's going to impact. And, um, you know, that makes me feel good, just thinking about the little kids, the parents, everybody's going to watch it. So that's one major thing. I want to remind everybody, all the pre meds about premedmondays.com. We do coaching every Monday night with you guys. We've got a group of pre-meds. You guys hop on with us, and we do coaching. We go through stuff. Yeah, got accountability groups, a lot of stuff to help you guys be successful. So check out premedmondays.com. And finally, diversemedicine.com. Doctors, pre-meds, healthcare professionals, everybody needs to be on diversemedicine.com. Check it out. We've got med schools on there. We've got med school recruiters. we got mentors. Get a mentor. Be a mentor. Whatever you need, diversemedicine.com is where it's at. All right. Now, I got all that off my plate. Okay, man. Dr. Russell Lede. That's the guest today, man. Dr. Russell Lede. So, you know, this video started circulating around social media, and it, I don't remember how it got to me, but it um, got to me somehow. And of course, you know, we share all this stuff. Black Men and White Coast, that's our whole platform. Right? All we do is try to put people on. So we share it. We share this stuff. And man, I watched this guy's video, and I'm not going to tell you the story because you're going to hear it in the podcast, but it was just so inspirational to me, man. So inspirational. And I just said, I got to reach out to him. And I go to my inbox. Um, to send him a message to try to reach out to him. And I see he had sent me a message like a year or two earlier. And, you know, it meant a lot to me to see this message he had sent me because the message he sent me was saying how much we inspired him on the journey. And I'm sitting there thinking about how much he just inspired me from watching his journey. And that just reminded me how, how it's all one big network. We're in this together. You inspire me, I inspire you. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. So, you know, Dr. Lede, I'm so excited and appreciative that you took the time out to do this podcast because your story is amazing man i'm not gonna ruin it for you guys but this story is amazing get your pen if you're pre-med take notes on the way he he navigated the system because he did his thing that's all i got to say about that he did his thing and you'll understand what i mean when you get to the end of the podcast man nothing else to say you got to hear from the man himself dr russell lede I want them bad like a dog, yeah. Oh, let do it like flogger, yeah. I'm kicking flay with no saga, yeah. Ayy, I like them blues. I might go Janet like Jackson. I got them eyes, yeah. It's all about progression. Life is like a blessing. Everything a win, loss is like a lesson. Ooh, ooh, yeah. Ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stepping. Ooh, ooh, yeah. If you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. If you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. So my story is, for a lack of better words, a story of 
what can you do next? And I say, what can you do next? Because I was taught and learned late in life that I was capable of doing um, amazing things. But I never knew that as a child, I dreamed a lot um, of getting out of where I was from, um, of becoming somebody. And for me, somebody was anybody who could provide for their family, who could pay their rent. Mortgage was never an idea um, or owning anything was never an idea. And so you know, I've, I've always looked back on this career, even as I'm, I'm traversing medical school and business school right now as um, what do I have the ability to do that I never was told I have the ability to do or no one ever exposed me to it. So I grew up in Lake Charles, Louisiana, um, in a little neighborhood called Car Shop. Um I guess you would call it the the stereotypical black neighborhood. You know, we had a lot of crime. Um, Everybody in the neighborhood, for the most part, was on food stamps. Um, A lot of us didn't have a daddy at home. Um, We was just trying to get by. We didn't go to the best schools. by no means. As a matter of fact, the high school I went to was um, closed down because we didn't really perform up to standard with quotation marks. Um, it was a black high school and I'm from the deep south, Lake Charles, Louisiana. So you could put two and two together. But, you know, I always share this part of my story because um, kids need to know that you know, although the success is shiny and pretty, um, the story is not always that way. Um, it's kind of like, you know, forging pressure towards a, you know, coal to get a diamond. Um, when I was in high school, um, my mom was in a precarious situation where she really couldn't afford, um, for us to stay in the house we were staying in. Um, we weren't on section eight, but we weren't paying that much in rent. But even then, so she was a certified nurse's aide and she just wasn't making that much money. And it finally got to the point to where she just couldn't afford it anymore. Well, um, in the South, we got this thing called a sugar daddy, which is basically some older man who tries to take advantage of generally a younger woman um, who's probably in a a financially vulnerable situation. and basically try to get them to come move in with them or kind of be, you know, a servant or a maid for them um, in exchange for them to take care of their bills because they probably well off. So my mom, and I don't blame her for it because she was just in a, in a crazy situation. She couldn't really afford to take care of me and my sister. And so she took that, that option. um, And she, she uprooted herself out of the house that we had stayed in for the majority of my childhood and he and I were at odds because I was growing into a young man and I really didn't see eye to eye with what was going on. Mind you, he was married. Um, he was married, but separated. And my mom was moving in. So, the ex, you know, the wife was looking at my mom's side eye and me and the man was not getting out of eye. So I kind of just opted to bounce around from here to there, staying on my best friend's back porch sometimes, um, my grandmother's house, who was also on Section 8, so I couldn't stay at her house that much. Um, And with my girlfriend at the time, who was, um, her mom would allow me to go to church with them. Um, And that's actually how, um, how, how I ended up finding out who Jesus Christ was. Um, and that's an important part of my story. And I always share it because um, I don't think I'd be where I was if I didn't have a relationship with God, um, because I think I would have lost a lot of my sanity just due to sheer stress. So, you know, like I said, my childhood was was rough. Um, 
it got so rough at one point where we were spending our afternoons in the back of Sam's Club, um, you know, digging in the dumpster for food. Um, me and my sister and my cousins, because Sam's Club would throw out food that was still kind of good. Um, and so we would take it. And, you know, as time went on, you know, through our high school, I kind of just looked at my girlfriend at the time, who's now close to 15 years of being my wife, um, her family and what they had going on. And I was just like, yo, that's something better. Um, I just don't know how to get it. Um, but I, I had gotten an option with joining the military. So I decided to join the United States Navy. Um, I had scored really well on the ASVAB, which is the test you take to get into the military. And they told me that I could go into intelligence, which everyone told me was a cushy job, you know, and um, I would get, you know, I'd be in air conditioning, I'd be sitting down, basically analyzing uh, data in the intelligence field. And I was like, sign me up. I get a meal, um, I get money, and I get to get away from where I'm from. Um, sign me up. So I finished high school um, and I went off to the military. And actually, before I could get to my intelligence training, I had um, I was selected while I was in boot camp to be in something called the United States Navy Ceremonial Guard. And the reason why that's important is because so those are the guys that you see on TV all the time with the pristine uniforms on and things of that nature. And so I got to, I got selected to do that. And so by being selected to do that, um, I was in Washington, D.C. Um, I was able to go on the White House grounds. I was able to go on the Navy Yard grounds. I was working in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, I had buried well over 2000 people. Um, it was such an honor. But I also got to meet some really important people. And when meeting these heads of state and all these other, you know, important people, secretary of state and the president, um, you know, you kind of start to ask these very basic questions, but they have enormous meaning. Like I would ask them, like, how do you become successful? Like, you know, what do you what do you do? And um, I'll never forget. Um, Master Chief Carolina told me once that. You know, in order to be successful, you never ask for for permission. You, you know, you kind of ask for forgiveness. And he kind of took that as saying, like, you got to go get what you want. Nobody's going to come around and hand it to you. So you got to start taking control of your narrative and start taking control of what you want in life. And um, although I was hesitant, I was like, OK, I'll give this a shot. Um, I started with some very basic things like. You know, I don't need anyone's permission to buy a rental property. Um, and my wife was, you know, a bit a bit um, further ahead because she came from, a, 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 I would say, a, a more well off family. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't need permission to save money. Um, I didn't need permission to build credit. Um, and those things may sound, you know, simple and, and elementary, but when you don't know what the world has to offer because you've never been told, then, you know, you don't know what to do. Um, people always ask me, well, you know, like, what was the education like when you were growing up? The education was terrible, um, but I did get quality education because although my mom only graduated high school at the time, she was adamant for some reason that I would have to read books. I think by the time I graduated high school, I had read well over 2000 books. Um, my mom would get me any kind of book she could. She worked as a CNA for a nursing home and she would get some of the books from the residents. Um, she would get books from anywhere on Sunday. She would take us to the library. Um, you know, she was just adamant about me reading. Um, but I had all this knowledge. I just didn't know how to apply it. Um, and I had never seen anyone apply before either. So I think role models are important and, and you know, and very much so in, in, in line with the mission of black men in white coats. Um, 
and a bunch of different other organizations. Like the idea is, is that exposure is key because if you have never seen it before, it's kind of hard for you to believe that it's possible. Um, and so getting back to the military, you know, once that happened, um, the world just kind of opened up to me. Um, I left Washington, D.C., and I went off to intelligence training down in Pensacola, Florida. Um, my wife and I, that was the first time we ever lived together. We got married while I was up in Washington, D.C. Um, and then um, she moved with me to Pensacola. And then during that training, um, you know, we kind of got the first few years of marriage out of the way. But my wife also started to subliminally established that I could create more in the world. I could be a creative. I could be a, a community impactor. I could be a leader. Um, and she started helping me to understand that I was capable. Um, and then, so I finished training there and then we moved to Mayport, Florida, because I was stationed upon uh, aboard a ship, the USS John L. Hall FFG 32, which is a small boy frigate um, ship for the United States Navy. Um, and we deployed, um, to a number of places from there. And as we started to deploy more and more and more, um, eventually my wife was like, nah, you got to find something else to do with your life because I'm going to need for you to be at home so we can build a family. Um, but I told her like, I'm making good money. Um, and we don't need anything. And I really, 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 really like being in the Navy. Um, but I did have a curiosity for getting an education. I didn't know what education really looked like at that level. Because mind you, when I was in high school, unfortunately, my thought process was only rich white people go to college. Um, my mom didn't know how to fill out a FAFSA form. Um, I never thought college was an option. As a matter of fact, the first time I ever saw a college degree was when my girlfriend at the time, who's now uh, been my wife, her uncle invited us over to their house. And um, I saw this degree on the wall from Southern University. Um, and I was like, yo, one day I'm going to get one of those. Um, and I'm still fascinated by <laughs> the idea that I went through a lot of my early adulthood not even thinking going to college was an option. Mind you, once you join the military, you can pretty much go to college for free. Um, but it just never, it never crossed my mind it was possible. Um, so when it was time for me to consider um, re-enlisting in the military, I had spent close to five years, my first uh contract was for five years in the United States Navy. My wife looked at me and said, look, I'm not, I don't want you to reenlist. I need for you to believe that you're capable of doing more. Um, and I didn't believe her. Um, and I was, I was hell bent that I was going to stay in the military and she was hell bent that I wasn't to the point to where she was like, it's either us in this marriage, um, or it's you in the military. And I was never, ever, ever willing to relinquish the relationship I was having with my wife for anything. So <laughs> she kind of pushed my boundaries and um, she helped me to apply to Southern University and a and College in, in, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And I got in. Um, and when I got in, um, we decided that we would move to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, we bought a house in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and I started undergrad and I was deciding that I was going to be a social worker because I was like, okay, now I can go to college. I'm going to go back and help out my community and get a bunch of young, you know, young folks who look like me to go to college. And, um, <laughs> it's crazy. I was sitting in a chemistry class at Southern and, um, I had memorized the periodic table in like one class period. It was so cool. And, you know, I, I, I as these classes would go by, I would, you know, be able to answer um, balancing equations and things of that nature, like off the top of my head. Chemistry just came to me. 
And I remember after one class, one of the chemistry professors um, coming up to me and saying, young man, what is your major? And I was like, oh, I'm going into social work. And they were like, no, you're not. Um, you, you're going to go into something in science because you seem to be brilliant. Um, and although I was hesitant, I, I was naive. So I was like, OK, whatever. And they were like, we're going to put you in touch with the scientists as well. So they put me in touch with Dr. Wesley Gray who was um, a biochemist working on natural products and extracts of those natural products to treat breast and prostate cancer. Um, and so he introduced me to the world of research. So if you're tracking this story, you start to realize that it's kind of like every new door that I went through was like, what? This has been in the world waiting on me ever since day one. And no one ever told me. So that's why that's part of the story is so important is because, man, for a lot of young folks, somebody just need to tell them that it's possible or show them that it's possible and then just let them blossom. If you put them in the right soil, they'll grow and they'll grow in, in, in amazing ways. And so, you know, so so the Southern University experience for me was fantastic. I got to I was able to pledge Phi Beta Sigma at Row Chapter. Um, at Southern, I was able to present at research like all over the country. Um, I did research at, um, Merck Pharmaceuticals as a United, a United Negro College Fund and Merck Fellow. Um, I got to meet the dean of NYU School of Medicine, um, graduate program, which was important. Um, and I'll tell you why in just one second. So, you know, I, I traversed Southern University. And as I traversed Southern University, um, I, I ended up with degrees in chemistry and biology, never took out one loan. Um, so all the education was free and it was just waiting on me. Um, we had our first daughter while I was there and um, I applied to graduate school to get a Ph.D. Because by then, this point, I realized I was capable of doing research. So. You know, with me being capable of doing research, um, the the world of creativity and my mind being able to think up new ways um, to treat prostate cancer and think about prostate cancer biology and biochemistry um, and the, the, the protein, you know, the protein makeup of different proteins in an oncogenic state, um, all these things just became this new world that I could explore, um, intellectually and, you know, just like a new toy that you never knew you were capable of having. Once you get it, you just, you can't put it down. So, um, I ended up getting, uh, an acceptance for a PhD program at NYU school of medicine by that exact same Dean that I met when I was, um, doing research over the summer as a UNCF Merck fellow. And he's still a mentor of mine to this day, um, Dr. Joel Oppenheim. Um, and he's kind of been like a grandfather to me in terms of teaching me. Um, he realized that I didn't know a lot about what I was capable of doing. And so he's been able to sit me down many times and tell me, you know, Russell, you're capable of doing this new thing that you're thinking about doing. It's just no one's ever told you. Um, and so I got to NYU School of Medicine and um, the second lab that I rotated through, I ended up doing my Ph.D. in that lab with uh, Dr. Garabedian and Dr. Susan Logan um, working on prostate cancer and understanding uh, modifications of proteins as a function of prostate cancer progression and um as possible modalities for treatment of prostate cancer, utilizing proteomic approaches. And I know that seems very complicated, but basically the idea was let's see where proteins have gone um, awry. And then let's see if we can um, alter the modifications of those proteins and see if that will slow the cancer down in a, in a nutshell. Um, but I also was able to get some very highly esteemed awards while I was there. I was able to um, be funded by the, F the Ford Foundation, um, which has been a pillar in the, you know, the education space for a very long time. 
Um, and I also was able to be funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, um, which was sort of the pinnacle of my research um, accolades in that the Howard Hughes Medical Institute is sort of like the creme de la creme of awards that you can get as a graduate student. And I was able to get it. Um, and I also was able to do some advocacy work while I was there. So um, my first year of graduate school, I was the diversity chair and I didn't want to just be the normal diversity chair. So I was like, I'm about to start a program um, and go get the worst kids in New York, um, you know, and, and bring them to essentially in my mind, what was, you know, the, the, the Mecca of research. I was at NYU school of medicine doing research, you know, the buildings were pristine and you could, you know, the labs were as full as possible. So, um, I did that. We started a program called clear direction mentoring. And a lot of those kids came out of that program thinking that they could be scientists. And some of them are on their way to becoming scientists. Um, and that, that really was, the first time that I, I got an inkling of an idea that I was it was possible for me to be an inspirer, an encourager, um, an exposer, um, a community orienter, um, just someone who would look out for my people and try to bring them along with me on this journey and give them access to what I had access to. And so. Um, fast forward to the last year of my PhD, um, I sat down with my mentors and I told them I'm, I'm uncomfortable with not understanding how the patient is treated for prostate cancer, but understanding a lot about the biology and biochemistry of prostate cancer. And so I think I want to go to medical school and, um, this is when I realized that my story was very captivating and it wasn't normal. Um, I just thought all the things that I went through was me just filling through a forest to figure out how to get to the other side. And I remember going to Wild Cornell Medical School for an interview for medical school. And one of the people I was interviewing with telling me right before the interview, hey, let's walk over to the pool. And at that point, I was confused because I was like, why are we going over to the pool? And he was like, jokingly, because I want to see if you can walk on water. And then he just sat me down and explained to me, he was like, your story is extraordinary. He's like, I've never seen anyone um, go through what you've gone through to get to this point. And so, you know, what can we do? <laughs> to sort of recruit you to come to Cornell. It wasn't the other way around where I was praying to God that I could get into Cornell. Um, it was the other way around. And so that's one of the moments when I realized like, oh, I might be a good thing. Um, and so, you know, fast forward to um, February 20th, 2018, my second daughter was born. Um, so Malia and was born in 2010 as a sophomore at Southern University. And then Melina Aubrey was born on February 20, 2018 at about 10, 15 in the morning. And at that point, I was writing my thesis for my um, PhD. I had already had a couple medical school acceptances. And um, but I was pretty adamant that I wasn't going to pay for medical school. I hadn't paid for my undergrad degrees. I hadn't paid for my master's or my PhD. And I wasn't going to pay for my MD. And about 15 minutes after Melina Aubrey was born on February 20th, 2018, I got an email from Tulane School of Medicine. And they told me that they were going to pay for my medical school education. And so I had accomplished all of these you know, accolades, two bachelor's degrees, a master's, a PhD, and now an MD. And I had never taken out a loan for any of this education. And it just actually recently dawned on me that, you know, all of this, I guess you would say rigmarole that I went through um, was worth it. Because in the end, I mean, one, 
the, the story is beautiful and, and I've learned a lot about how to overcome issues. But two, um, you know, I'm not in debt. And that's an amazing thing um, to get all of this education and not have to pay for any of it. So um, I decided to come to Tulane University School of Medicine. I looked at my wife and told her, honey, we're going home. Um, we came back to Louisiana, um, which was kind of what I wanted to do anyway. And um, I started at Tulane School of Medicine to you know, to, to get my MD. And I also decided to get my MBA too, because I understood that if I really want to be a leader in the healthcare sector, whether that's in philanthropy or in healthcare administration or in the private sector, um, as a physician researcher or in any fashion, um, I need to understand how capitalism and how business works in America, um, so that I can affect change in the ways that I, I, I hope to. And so, you know, that's kind of uh, in a nutshell, uh, my journey up until this point. Um, you know, the things that I, I love to do are to be influential in my community. And I'll tell the short story. Recently, there was a photo that came out of 15 black medical students who were standing in front of, um, a slave quarter on the Whitney plantation in Edgar, Louisiana. And um, I'm actually the person behind that. And the story behind that is that the summer before we took that photo, me and my daughter and one of my best friends, Philip Thomas, who was getting his PhD in the same lab as me when I was at NYU, um, visited that plantation. And as we were leaving, about 15 minutes down the road, my daughter stops me and she says, Dad, I was like, what's up, Malia? And she was like, I finally get it now. This was after we had left the plantation. She said, I understand now why being a black doctor in America is such a big deal. And I was like, what do you mean by that? And she was like, because think about it. There was a time when black people were enslaved. They couldn't be engineers, authors, doctors, lawyers, scientists, any of that. And I'm riding in the car with two of them. So just imagine how far we've come. And this was an eight year old speaking to me at the time. So after she said that, I looked over at Philip and I said, man, I got an idea. Um, I'm going to get some of my classmates and we're going to go there in all black and our white coats. And we are going to um, take some photos in front of those slave cabins to show the world just how far um, black people have come. Um, despite systems that were put in place to try and destroy us and take us out of this world. And that went absolutely bonkers. Um, it went viral and it caught the attention of millions of people across the world. Um, since then, we formed a company and we've raised some money to put those photos in classrooms um, around the country. So far, we've distributed well over 2000 photos um, at a poster size. And anyone can go to our website, uh, www.the15whitecoats.org. Um, and look at the work that we've done. Schools can go on there and sign up for a poster for their classroom for free and we'll, we'll mail it to them. Um, and you can donate on there and everything. But basically the point behind that is, is that now we have a platform to impact change and contribute to the work that, you know, some of the pillars in, in this space, like black men in white coat, um, have been doing for a long time. Um, and we just want to do our part, but, I never in a million years looking back over my life, especially my younger life, thought that I'd be able to do some of the things that I'm doing right now. And um, it's really a dream come true, you know, and, and for my children to be able to see it is, is the very best part. Um, my advice to, you know, any young person out here, you know, doing anything positive in the community is to keep on going. Never stop. Keep going. Absolutely. Keep going. Don't, um, don't quit. Find you some mentors. Um, ask them to pay attention to what you have going on. Ask them to help you. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll tell you all, uh, is recently I started my surgery rotation. Um, 
at Baton Rouge General Hospital in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this, this, I think this will capture what I'm really trying to get to you all in this, in this story. Um, Baton Rouge General is the same hospital I was once a security guard at when I was studying at Southern University. And I was able to go back there um, and operate um, with vascular surgeons. And that meant so much to me because I remember being there as a security guard and dreaming of the day of being anything close to a doctor. And I wouldn't get any play when I would start to tell people like one day I want to be a doctor and they'd be like, man, you crazy. You're a security guard. And look at me now, you know? So it, my point to that is, is that don't let anyone tell you what you're not capable of. Don't let anyone lie to you. Um, you're capable. You're capable. God made you capable. Um, don't let anyone sit up here and lie to you. And um, if you need someone to tell you so, um, look up me, look up Dr. Dale, um, look up some of the pillars in the community because there, there are some brothers and sisters out here who really are rooting for you and your future. Um, and that's my piece. Hopefully it's helped you. Um, I pray that it's, it's giving you some inspiration. And um, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. What didn't I tell you all? That was an amazing story. Dr. Dave, thank you so much for being on the Black Men and White Coast podcast. What a story. So many things I could pick out from that. Um, you know, but off the bat, right off the bat, I'm going to tell you guys, you heard how he grew up as a child. You heard his upbringing. 9.9 .9 out of 10 of the people who listen to this did not have an upbringing that challenged him. But look where he's at today. So off the bat, no excuses, right? No excuses. He made it. You can make it absolutely no excuses, right? But so th that's amazing. But what I really thought was amazing, he man, he navigated this whole entire medical, all the education. Look at look how much education he has with no debt. <laughs> how much education he has with no debt, right? So when people come come to me from now on to say, hey, Dr. Dale is expensive, I'm going to say, go check out Dr. Lede's podcast. Go check it out. No excuse whatsoever. You got to hustle. You got to work hard. You got to be willing to put in the work. And if you do that, you could make it, right? It's not just like he's any regular student either. Look at all the things he's achieved. He has done his thing, man, starting from a security guard, becoming a doctor, and just the, the way he saw something that he wanted, and he went after it, and he got it. He saw something he wanted. He said there are no excuses. He went after it, and he got it. Man, I wish more people had that mindset. I wish more people had that mindset. Think about what kind of world we'd be in if people just said, you know what, and y'all got to understand, I'm talking about good things. I don't want people out there doing foolish things now, but the good things, right? Think about if we say, I want to be the president. I'm going after it. I want to be a doctor. I'm going after it. I want to be a CEO. I'm going after it, right? Think about all that stuff. If people just had that mindset rather than having the mindset like, man, I wish I could be the president. I wish I could be a doctor. Listen to Dr. Lede's story. No excuses whatsoever. You see it. You go after it from a security guard, watching the doctors walk into the building, to saying, I'm going to be that man. And now he's that man. That's what I'm talking about, man. Really appreciate you, my brother. Really appreciate you being on the podcast and sharing your story to inspire not just black men, but all the listeners. Let anybody know that they can do what you did. Just got to put their mind to it, man. I'm definitely going to be using a lot of your, your story to to educate my own children and I let them know that if they grind, if they put in the work, that it's well worth it for them, man. I appreciate you, brother. All right, so thanks for listening. You guys know I love you, man. One more reminder for the pre-meds, check out premedmondays.com. Also for the pre-meds, diversemedicine.com. For everybody else, to diversemedicine.com. We've got a whole system set up there where people are being mentored. We've got recruiters on the recruiting pre-meds. We spend a lot of time, and honestly, we spend quite a bit of our own money out of our own pockets to build this stuff for you guys so you guys can use it for free. Um, diverse Medicine, so take advantage of it, all right? Take advantage of it. And, man, we're here for y'all, man. You know, we love you. And until next time, y'all be safe, man. Ooh. I want them bad like a dog, yeah. Oh, let do it like flogger, yeah. I'm kicking flavor, no saga, yeah. Hey, I like them blues. I'm 
might go Janet like Jackson. I got them options, y'all. Yeah. It's all about progression. Life is like a blessing. Everything a win, loss is like a lesson. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah, ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stepping. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, if you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. If you wanna go get it, stop playing around. Really got on racks, ain't playing around. Black man, white yeah. coat, shit, we up right now, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta set you a goal.